Please turn with me to our scripture reading this morning, Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God had rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Thanks, Abby. Well, we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Genesis this morning. And as John mentioned last week, we're kind of backtracking again this morning to dig a little deeper into a passage that we sort of already preached on a couple weeks ago. So if you remember, um, two weeks ago, John preached on the creation account in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. But in doing that, there, there are several things going on in those verses, and there's just no way that we could get into all of them in one sermon. And so two weeks ago, John focused specifically on kind of creation itself, that overarching story of creation itself. And then last week, we backed up and looked at chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, on how humans are created in the image of God and what that means and now this week, we're going to look at the verses that Abby just read for us in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, and dig into the seventh day and what's going on there. And so most of us are probably familiar with this last day of the creation account, right? Like, on the seventh day, God rested. Um, or, or at least we think we're familiar with what's going on here. But what we're going to see in these verses this morning is that our picture of rest is probably quite a bit different than God's rest on day seven. And even our idea of the seventh day is probably quite a bit different than what's actually happening on the seventh day here in Genesis 2. Like we can tend to think of rest as, as taking it easy, doing nothing, uh, pampering yourself, getting a little me time, right? And so that, that's what we expect rest to look like here. But we're going to see a pretty different picture of rest in Genesis 2 that's going to challenge our understanding of what rest actually is. And we can have this, this picture of seventh day rest in particular that ties into the idea of Sabbath, where it's kind of formal and stuffy, and there's this whole list of stuff that you can't do, and, and where it's really more of a burden than a break. Uh, but what we're going to see is that this picture of the seventh day uh, the, that, that picture of the seventh day that I just talked about there, it, it couldn't be any further from the seventh day that we're going to see here in Genesis 2. Uh, when we understand what the seventh day is here, it, it'll totally change how we think about and practically approach the seventh day and the idea of Sabbath in our lives, um, which, which may be one of the main things on your mind as we come to these verses, the, this idea of Sabbath. And you may be expecting this to be a sermon about what you can do and what you can't do on the Sabbath. But what we're going to see is that that's not actually what this passage is about at all. What we're going to see is that this passage is about something way bigger that does tie into the Sabbath, and, and we'll talk about how. But when you see how it all fits together as part of the bigger story of the Bible, like how all this applies to us today may be a little surprising but hopefully it will also free you up and leave you thinking about rest and how to apply all of this in a whole different way by the time we get to the practical application at the end. And so you can see on your handout then there where we're going this morning. Um, first, we're going to dig into these three verses in Genesis 2. We're going to unpack the meaning and significance of the seventh day here in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. And then we're going to zoom out and touch on how the seventh day connects to the biblical storyline from 2 verse 4 on. And we're only going to be able to just scratch the surface on that. But it's so huge when it comes to understanding the rest of Genesis and even the rest of the Bible. And then after seeing all of that, we'll be in a position then to, to bring everything together and talk about a few implications of the seventh day for our lives. And so first here, um, the meaning and significance of the seventh day in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. And so there, there are two main components to the meaning and significance of the seventh day here in Genesis 2, two, two elements that the text emphasizes. 
And so the first one is that the seventh day marks the completion of God's creating work. That's the first thing that you notice here, starting in verse 1. Um, it says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. So two different times here, in, in the middle of verse 1, and in the first part of verse 2, you see that word finished. Um, and so the heavens and the earth were finished, and on the seventh day, God finished his work. And so that word there, it means more than just that he stopped. It, it means that he stopped because he was done. Like there was nothing more to do. It, it was complete. His work was complete. It's like putting together a puzzle and you put the last piece in place. Like it's finished. It's complete. And so notice then what, what verse 1 says specifically was finished. Uh, two things, right? First, the heavens and the earth. And then second, all the host of them. And so this is referring back to what we saw in Genesis 1, how God formed and filled in the first six days. Remember, so days one to three, he formed realms or habitations. Um, day one, the light and the dark realm. Day two, sky and sea. And day three, dry land. And all those realms or habitations together are collectively called the heavens and the earth. Like that's what the first part of the verse is saying was finished. And then days four to six, God filled those realms. He filled those habitations with inhabitants. So day four, the sun, moon, and stars for the light and dark realm. Day five, birds and fish for the sky and sea realms. Day six, animals and humans for the dry land realm. And so that's what the second part of verse one is saying was finished. All the hosts of them are all the inhabitants of all the different habitations within the heavens and earth. So the point is, it's all finished. Like the heavens and the earth have been completely formed and they've been completely filled with all their hosts. And then Genesis 1:31 says, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. So God's creating work is done, which gets repeated three times in these three verses here. So that's the first emphasis, that the seventh day marks the completion of God's creating work. And now you might be thinking like, wait a second though, like didn't God actually finish creating on day six though? Like why does this say that he finished on the seventh day? Which is a great question. Um, and the answer is that this is just one more way that the, the creation account is designed to put all the emphasis on the seventh day. And, and this is huge. Like we tend to think the emphasis is on day six because that's when humans were created. But actually, the text puts all the emphasis on the seventh day. And we miss a lot of this in English. But in the Hebrew, the number seven is, is woven into every part of the creation account. John touched on this briefly a couple weeks ago. It's worth coming back to here. If you remember, John pointed out how that not only are there seven days of creation, but there are seven parts to what happens on each day. And then John also mentioned that Genesis 1-1 is seven words in the Hebrew. Oh, but it goes even deeper than that. Genesis 1-2 is actually 14 words in the Hebrew, so two sevens. Then Genesis 2-1-3, which is the other bookend for the creation account, in, in the Hebrew it's five lines. The middle three lines all have seven words each. And so you have 1-1 one, one is seven words, 1-2 one, two is two times seven, and then 2, 1 to 3 has three sevens. And those bookend the seven days of creation, which are each made up of seven parts. And then not only that, but the three lines here in 2, 1 to 3 uh, that have seven words each, the middle words in each line are the seventh day. And not only that, but the words for hosts and rest all sound like the Hebrew word for seven. And so I know like that's super technical and nerdy, but, but catch the point here. Like everything in this, everything is designed as a play on the word seven and on the number seven. It's like everywhere you look through Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3, it's seven, 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 seven. And, and it, the whole point is to highlight and underline and put in bold print that the seventh day is the focus. It's the point. Like ev yes, everything else that happens and all the other days is important, but it's all headed somewhere, and that somewhere is the seventh day. Like, everything was aiming for the seventh day all along. 
So, so chapter two then is saying that God finished on the seventh day. It's not an accident. It, it's one more way that the creation account is designed to point us to the seventh day as the goal and culmination of creation. And so the question is why? Like why does the seventh day matter so much? Well, that leads us to the second emphasis in the text then when it comes to the meaning and significance of the second day. It's that the seventh day marks the beginning of God's rest. You see this in verses two and three. It says, on the seventh day, God finished all the work that he'd done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So just like in verses one to two, they use the word finished twice to emphasize the, the completion of God's creating work. Here in verses two and three, the word rested is used twice to explain how God responded to being finished with his creating work. So the question is like, what does that mean? What does it mean that God rested? Like, was he worn out from all the hard work of forming and filling in days one to six, and so now he needed to take a little nap? Um, like, he needed a little breather? Um, he, he needed to take a personal day for a little self-care? Like, no, like, we, we know it can't mean that. Like, God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. Like, he doesn't get tired. Isaiah 40, 28 says, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. So it cannot mean that God rested because he was tired. I guess also can't mean that he stopped working completely. Like Colossians 1, 17 says that God didn't just create all things, he holds all things together. Hebrews 1, 3 says he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So if God had stopped working altogether, everything that he had just made would have disintegrated. And so, so what does it mean then that God rested on the seventh day? Well, it means a couple of things. One, the word rested there, it, it's the word Shabbat, which uh, is where the word Sabbath comes from. So the original audience would have heard that connection. And, and that word means to stop or to cease. So in that sense, what this is saying here is that God finished his work, and so he stopped. He ceased. And again, in context, the work here is specifically God's creating work. So what this is saying is that God finished his creating work, and so God ceased. He stopped creating because it was complete. It was done. It was finished. So that, that's the first thing that God rested means. It means that God ceased from his creating work because it's finished and very good after day six. But there's another aspect to God rested here that, that's maybe not quite as obvious at first glance, but when you press into what's going on here, it's clearly what we're supposed to understand is happening, and, and it's this. God rested means that God took his throne to rule over and enjoy his creation. So all through the creation account, God is being portrayed as a king establishing his kingdom. And so like a king, he speaks and his word is obeyed, not just by people, but by everything, by light and darkness, by earth and seas, by stars and birds and fish, like all of it obeys his word, like immediately. And so he shows himself to be the king because he speaks and it's so. And he shows himself to be king because he made everything. And so it all belongs to him. Like, it's all under his authority. And so he's the king establishing his kingdom through creation. And then here on the seventh day, it's finished. And so with that picture of God as king in mind, God rested is intended to bring our minds uh, this picture of the king now taking his throne to begin to rule and reign over the kingdom that he has established so Isaiah 66.1 is one place that connects these dots for us. Isaiah 66.1, God says, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? Like, do you see it? Heaven is God's throne and the earth is his footstool. Like, that's where he rests. In Isaiah, he's challenging our idea of building a temple for God to rest in, not in the sense of just sitting there and doing nothing, in the sense of ruling and reigning from his throne over the creation that he made. And the point is, nothing that we could build could contain him. 
Like he rests on his throne in heaven and rests his feet on earth as his footstool, ruling and reigning over creation. Like that's why the seventh day matters so much. Like on the seventh day, God rests in the sense of ceasing from his creating work because it's finished and it's very good after day six, but he also rests in the sense of now taking his throne to rule over and enjoy his creation, sustaining it and upholding it by the word of his power. And then that's exactly what we see him doing then in verse three. He begins to take kingly action first by blessing the seventh day. And this should draw our minds back to chapter one because we've seen God's blessing a couple times already. First in chapter one, verse 22, when God created the birds and the fish. Um, verse, verse 120, or chapter 122 says, God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. So God's blessing there, it's connected to their fruitfulness and multiplication. And then you see it again after God created humans in chapter one, uh, verse 28 God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God also said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of the earth, every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And so again, God's blessing here, it's connected to fruitfulness, multiplication, but in these verses, it's also connected to the humans exercising dominion like we talked about last week, and it's also connected to God providing food for both the humans and the animals. And so the picture of God's blessing here is is of God providing for his creatures and them flourishing under his care, being fruitful, multiplying, carrying out the roles that God gave them And God then connects that idea of blessing in verse three to the seventh day. And he also then takes kingly action as well by making the seventh day holy. And so the word there means that he set it apart or or he removed it from common use for himself. And so the point is that God sovereignly sets this day apart and makes it different from all the other days. And so at, at one level, like this is setting up the Sabbath command that God is going to give Israel in Exodus, which again, uh, the original audience would have made that connection, that, that one day a week is set apart from the other six. And, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But here in this passage, the seventh day is set apart in another way. Like the seventh day breaks the sevenfold pattern that we saw on all the other six days. There's no God said, there's no let there be, there's no it was so, there's no it was good, there's no shaping, there's no naming, which all makes sense because God had finished his creating work and now he's ruling and reigning over creation. Oh, but, but don't miss this. Like this is probably the most significant way the seventh day is different. And, and this is a huge clue that, that something way bigger is going on here than just that one day out of seven ought to be set aside for God. Like, there's no evening and morning. Do you see that? And so, so I'm not saying that the that day and night cycle stopped on the seventh day or that there was no eighth day or ninth day or anything like that. But, but in the text, literarily, the seventh day doesn't end, which makes sense as well, right? Because God doesn't just take a day off and then get back to work. Like, no, his creating work is done. So his rest his sitting on his throne, ruling and reigning and enjoying his creation, blessing his creation, it keeps on going. Like it doesn't end. And so to put all that together, like here's what we're supposed to see is happening on the seventh day. God has finished his creating work. The king has established his kingdom. It's complete and very good after day six. So he ceases from his creating work and he takes his throne to rule and reign and enjoy what he has made. So his forming work is done, his filling work is done, and now he's ruling and sustaining and blessing his creation. Like that's the meaning and significance of the seventh day. That's what it means that God rested on the seventh day. And so we can sum it up like this. Um, You can see this on your handout. When we think of the seventh day and God's seventh day rest, what we're supposed to picture is this. We're supposed to picture God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing. 
And this is going to be huge throughout Genesis. So you need to keep these categories in mind as we go. God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing. And again, here in Genesis 2, that's not just one day in seven. It's, it's every day. It doesn't end. So that's the meaning and significance of the seventh day and God's seventh day rest here in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. God's creating work is finished. Now he's ruling over and enjoying his creation. God's people are in God's place, flourishing and multiplying, carrying out their God-given tasks under God's rule and blessing and provision. And so the question then is, how does that connect to the rest of Genesis and the rest of the Bible? Because I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like the world that we live in today. And so that's the next thing that we need to talk about to understand this idea of seventh day and seventh day rest is how the seventh day connects to the biblical storyline. And oh, there is so much that we could get into here and and it would be a whole lot of fun. Um, But I'm going to try to just touch on three points here this morning so that we have time to draw some implications from all this. But but hopefully this will get you started so that you can see this in your own time in the word and, and hopefully we'll be able to point out some of this as we keep going through Genesis as well. But here's how Genesis 2, 1 to 3 sets up the rest of the biblical storyline. First, we were made to live in God's rest. Like this is the point of the seventh day being the focus of the creation account. Like the seventh day is the goal and culmination of creation. It's what it was all headed toward all along. And this is the point of the seventh day not ending in Genesis 2-3. Like that's how everything was supposed to continue to be every day from there on. So even though in Genesis 2, 4 and following, like we're going to kind of backtrack chronologically and we're going to zoom in on the creation of man and woman, and and even Genesis 2, 15, where God places Adam in the garden to work it and keep it, again, literally, Moses placed that after Genesis 2, 1 to 3 for a reason. And part of that is that we're supposed to see Adam and Eve in the garden working and keeping it in the context of the seventh day and God's rest. And so at at this point in the narrative, like God doesn't tell them to work and keep the garden for six days and rest on the seventh day. I mean, maybe that's implied in them being created in the image of God that they would follow that pattern. But in the text, the picture is that they're working and keeping the garden every day is in the context of this ongoing seventh day and God's rest and God's blessing and God's provision. So, I mean, like, just picture this. Like, they're cultivating the garden and they're exercising dominion over creation, but it's like everything they do, everywhere they go, it just sprouts and blooms and flourishes and multiplies because of God's blessing and God's provision. Like, it's work, but it's the kind of work like, like kids playing. Like, if you ever watch kids play, like, they're, they're working, but it's, it's pure joy. Like, that's the world that we were made to live in. And so see this, like, like true rest isn't about vegging out or taking it easy or lazing around or getting some me time. Like, like it's about living and working and flourishing under God's rule and blessing like Adam and Eve in the garden. But unfortunately, that doesn't last for very long. Instead, what we're going to see in just a couple of weeks in Genesis 3 is that we were exiled from God's rest in the fall. That's the next part of the story. We were exiled from God's rest in the fall. And so I feel like we've already had to say this several times, but not to spoil the story, um, and and we'll look at this way more in depth in a couple weeks, but but if you didn't know, um, Adam and Eve are tempted by a serpent to not live under God's rule, but to take God's throne for themselves and they listen to the serpent. And so because of their sin, they're exiled from the garden. And in that, they're not just exiled from the garden, they're exiled from God's rest. Now they are no longer in the same sense, in God's place or under God's rule and blessing. 
And so what, Adam's, or what God says to Adam in response to Adam's sin paints a whole different picture of life and work on this side of the fall. God says in chapter three, he says, cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So now, instead of work being a joy and everything they do flourishing and multiplying like it was in the garden, now work is going to be hard and the ground isn't going to just sprout up good things for them everywhere they go. It's gonna sprout up thorns and thistles and they're gonna have to work and sweat to survive and in the end, they'll die. They'll return to the dust they were taken from. Like that's life on this side of the fall. Because of sin, we've been exiled from the seventh day rest that we were made for, and we're still suffering the consequences of that today. Oh, but praise God, the Bible doesn't end after Genesis 3. Um, and and we, as we go on in Genesis and into the rest of the Bible, what we're going to see is, and this is the next part of the story you can see on your hand out there, the rest of the Bible is about how we can enter God's rest again and live there forever. Oh, like this is the one I wish we could really take time to dig into. But we're, we're going to see this woven through Genesis, the, the longing for this rest that we've been exiled from, and hence all over the place that this is where we're heading again. And so immediately after Adam and Eve sinned, God promises that he's going to send someone who's going to undo what they had done. And so from there on, that's the longing and that's the question. Like, who is this going to be? Who's going to be the one? And so a couple of really quick examples. Noah, his name is a play on the word rest because his father said that maybe this is gonna be the one to bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And so if you know the story, what happens? Noah's brought through the flood to a new creation, specifically a garden surrounded by animals. And we're like, is this it? Like, is, is he gonna be the one? But then Noah has his own fall and he's not the one. And then we're gonna see God call Abram. And, and just think about what God promises that he's going to do for Abram. He's going to make him a great nation. He's going to take him to a promised land and he's going to bless all nations through him. So God's people, God's place, and God's blessing, right? Like God's rest restored. That's what God promises Abram. But it doesn't come during Abram's life or his son's lives. In fact, like his descendants end up in slavery in Egypt it's the exact opposite of rest. But God rescues them out of slavery in the book of Exodus. He makes them his special covenant people and he renews his promise to take them to the promised land, which he calls a place of rest. And he's going to make them a blessing there. And it's here then where God gives the command to keep the Sabbath for the first time. And the Sabbath functions as a sign of God's relationship with Israel. It's part of what sets them apart from everywhere else, everyone else, um, that they cease their work one day a week and rest. And God specifically ties this back to the fact that he rested on the seventh day in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. And so here's the thing. Israel treated the Sabbath day like a burden, focusing on all the things that they couldn't do. But the whole point was for the Sabbath to be a blessing. Like it was supposed to be one day a week where they would live like they were back in the original seventh day. Like it was a day for them to enjoy God's blessing and provision. It was a day to remind them that God's rest is where they're ultimately headed. But Israel fell too. They did enter the promised land, and for a while, it looked like they were flourishing. Like under Solomon, 1 Kings 5 says that God gave them rest on every side. But instead of living under God's rule and blessing in God's place, they turned to other gods, and so they were exiled again. But then, fast forward, God sent Jesus. He's the one we were waiting for. He's the one who brings us back into God's seventh day rest. He fulfills everything the Sabbath pointed to. 
first spiritually by dealing with our sin that caused our exile in the first place by his perfect life, living fully under God's rule and blessing, and then by taking the death that our sin deserved on the cross. Oh, and just think about this. Think about how Jesus' death is connected to what we saw in Genesis 2, 1 to 3. In, in John's account of Jesus' death, John 19, verse 30, the last thing Jesus says is, it is finished. His work was done. And then guess what the next day was? It's the seventh day. Jesus rested in the tomb on the seventh day, but he didn't stay dead. He was raised to life as the firstborn of the new creation, and he entered into a new seventh day rest and then he was exalted to the right hand of the Father to, to rule and reign over his creation. We read it early in Hebrews 10. He sat down at the right hand of the Father to rule and reign over his creation. And so now those who are united to Jesus by turning from our sin and trusting in Jesus enter into that spiritual rest with him. Oh, but it doesn't end there. One day, Jesus is going to come again and bring us into God's rest physically and forever the very end of the Bible, Revelation 21.5 says, And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. And then guess what there isn't in the new creation? Revelation 21.23, The city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day. There will be no night there. Revelation 22, 5, night will be no more. They will need no light of the lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Oh, the, the new creation is the ultimate, never-ending, seventh-day rest. Like, that's where everything is headed. Oh, the best way I can think to illustrate uh, this is, is this. Like, do, do you know what a Venn diagram is? Have you seen those before, like the overlapping circles? You know what I'm talking about? So, so in the beginning, there were two fully overlapping circles. Like, you could call one of them God's space and one of them human space, or you could call them heaven and earth. Like, and so that's what seventh day rest is. It's those two circles fully overlapping, heaven and earth fully overlapping, God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. In the fall, though, those two circles are split apart. And so now we're living outside of God's rest. Instead of living in the realm of God's blessing and life, because of sin, we've been exiled to the realm of death and we're headed for God's judgment. But then through Jesus, and now in the church, those two circles have begun to overlap again. And so in Jesus, in a real way, we, we enter into and experience that seventh day rest, not just one day a week, but every day. But the circles still aren't fully overlapping again yet. But that's where we're headed. In the new creation, the two circles will fully overlap again. We'll experience fully the seventh day rest that we lost in the fall. We'll be God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing again. And, and this time it will last forever and ever. Like that's how the seventh day connects to the rest of the biblical storyline. We were made to live in God's rest. We were exiled from God's rest though in the fall. And then the rest of the Bible is about how we can enter God's rest again and live there forever. And the answer is Jesus. So what does all that mean for us here this morning then? And this is where we're going to spend our, our last few minutes. We're, we're going to have to fly through this. But this is where the quote that we've already talked about a couple of times um, comes into play again in, in, this, uh, in, in our sermon this morning. This is, this is why we needed to take the time to do what we just did. Because we can only answer the question, what am I to do? if we can answer the prior question of what story do I find myself a part? And so if everything we just talked about then is the story that we're part of, like what are we to do? Well, here are a few implications for our lives that hopefully will make a lot of sense in light of everything that we've just talked about. And so first, if you're here this morning or you're listening to this and you're, you're not a Christian, the application for you this morning is to enter God's rest through Jesus today. Like, if you're not a Christian, because of Adam's sin and your own, you have been exiled from God's rest. 
But through Jesus, you can enter God's rest today. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so the plea for you this morning, if this is you, is to, is to trust in Jesus and to enter God's rest through him. And you can do that right where you're sitting. Just cry out to God right now. Confess that you deserve to be exiled for your sin and that you deserve the ultimate exile of death. But then cry out for Jesus to forgive you and rescue you and bring you into his rest Oh, and then talk to someone before you leave this morning. Like, we'd love to, to talk to you more about what it looks like to enter God's rest through Jesus. That's the first implication uh, and application if, if you're not a Christian. Second, though, if you are a Christian, rest in Jesus every day now. Like, rest in Jesus every day now. Like this is huge. In light of the storyline of the Bible and how Jesus fulfills everything that the Sabbath points to, before we get to the idea of resting one day a week, like, we need to see how in a real sense we have entered into God's rest in Jesus and we are to live every day resting in him. Like, now in Jesus, we are truly God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing again. And those who have entered into God's rest in Jesus, like, we're to live every day in that rest, in God's rest, in that sense and so Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, it applies to us as well. Like that's the heart posture that should characterize us every day as Christians. Like we don't rest in Jesus just one day a week. We do that every day. We come to him every day and find rest for our souls in him. And so practically speaking, like this is where the spiritual disciplines of spending time in the word and prayer daily come in. Like the goal is to come daily to Jesus for rest for your soul so that you live and work from a place of rest in Jesus every day because we still do live in this fallen world for now. So our, our physical work is still hard and exhausting and we'll talk more about that in a second. But, but coming to Jesus every day and finding rest for our souls in him every day completely transforms then how we approach and how we experience our physical work in this world Instead of feeling beaten down and broken and frustrated and exhausted by it, we can rest in the middle of it, knowing that it's only temporary and that our true rest has begun in Jesus. Which leads us to the next implication. is to look forward to resting in the new creation when Jesus returns. Look forward to resting in the new creation when Jesus returns. Like that's still where everything is headed and that's where our eyes must remain fixed. Like we can be so easily tempted to look for the rest that we'll only fully experience in the new creation here and now. But that's not where we are yet. And so let the difficulty of work now and the frustration of work now remind you that we're not in the new creation yet. And let it stir your heart for that day more and more. Oh, and all that should shape our expectations and reshape our expectations of what resting in the new creation is going to look like as well. Like, it's not going to be sitting on a cloud, playing a harp, and doing nothing forever and ever. Like, no, God made us to work, but it will be work restored to what it was meant to be in the beginning, where everything we do, everywhere we go, will sprout and bloom and flourish because of God's blessing and God's provision. Like, we'll exercise dominion in the new creation the way we were intended to in the beginning as God's people, in God's place, under God's rule and blessing. Like that's what we were made for. And Jesus is coming soon. So look forward to that day. Oh, in a lot of ways, like when we understand Genesis 2, 1 to 3 and how it fits with the storyline of the Bible, like those three things that we just talked about really are the main applications for us today. But I think there's one more that's worth talking about as well, because it's probably the one that a lot of us came in this morning having in mind thinking about this passage um, and, and had in mind at the beginning of our time together this morning. And, and it's this idea of Sabbath, of, of taking a day off every week. Like, how does that fit in to all of this? And so let me just say this, like, there are different understandings when it comes to this. 
Um, and, and I've gone back and forth on, on this, honestly. Um, and so here's where I am right now. Um, and, and we can talk about this if you see this differently uh, afterwards. But, but in light of everything we've talked about today, like here's how I would say the idea of Sabbath ties into all this. And you can see this on your handout. I, I would say consider resting one day a week as a subversive habit. So I've already said this along the way, but, but just to, again, bring it all together and say it here, I would say that for us as Christians, Sabbath is not a command anymore. Like Jesus fulfilled everything Sabbath pointed toward. We, we rest every day in him. But we're also not yet living in the full and final fulfillment of the seventh day. So in the meantime, this idea of Sabbath or, or principle of Sabbath can be a helpful and good spiritual discipline. Or, or I've talked about this idea of subversive habits before, like habits that intentionally subvert the false stories that we're tempted to believe. So, so this can be a helpful subversive habit to regularly reset our lives and remind us of the story that we belong to. Like when we don't stop and rest regularly, we feed the false story that our lives depend on our work and that we're the ones who keep the world running. And it feeds the false story that we were made for this world. And so in that sense, stopping and resting every seventh day subverts that false story by reminding yourself that you aren't the one ruling and reigning over the world and reminding yourself that the, of the rest that you were made for and that you will one day enjoy in the new creation. And stopping one day a week regularly like this reminds us to rest every day in Jesus and reminds us to look forward to resting in the new creation when Jesus returns. And, and so I know then that all the questions then that come up when I, when I say that, like, well, okay, so then, well, what day are we supposed to do that? And what things am I supposed to do? What things am I supposed to not do on that day? And, but hopefully, at this point, you can see in light of everything we've talked about this morning that, that since Jesus fulfilled everything the Sabbath pointed to, there's a lot of flexibility then in answering those questions. There's, there's room for creativity in what resting one day a week looks like for you. And so I'm, I'm really hesitant to get very specific at all here. Um, and so instead, what I wanna do, and these aren't on your handout, but you can jot these down. Here's just a few questions to consider as you think about potentially resting one day a week as a subversive habit. And so first, the first question would be, what day can you set apart in your week? And so I, I don't think, in light of everything that we've talked about this morning, I don't think that we're supposed to think of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath. Um, Sunday may be a good day for you to set apart, though, or there may be another day based on your, your schedule that's better. Um, but the point is that since we rest in Jesus every day, I think there's flexibility on this as, as far as what day you specifically set aside for this purpose. And so what day of the week can you set apart uh, in your week for this purpose of resting like this? The next question then would be, what do you need to stop doing that day? What do you need to stop doing that day? And so here's kind of the, the, the way to think about this. Like, what ways are you working on a normal day that feed into the sense that you are responsible to sustain your life and provide for yourself? Or what things are feeding into the sense of work being hard and frustrating? Or what things are feeding into the sense that you were made for this world? Like those might be some things to set aside one day a week. Then the next question, the third question would be, what kinds of things will you do to enjoy God's rest that day? And so, yeah, the point here is it's not to stop doing everything and do nothing or do as little as possible on that day. It's to do things that give you a taste of, what, of the rest that you have in Jesus and that we will have in the new creation. Like that's the goal in taking a day off each week in this way. It's, it's not a burden, it's a gift. It's about living for one day every week as if you were fully experiencing God's seventh day rest in anticipation of living in his rest forever when Jesus returns. Like it's a taste every seventh day of the rest that we were meant to have in the beginning that we do have in Jesus now and that we will one day experience fully and forever. Like, doesn't that sound awesome? I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? 
And so in doing that then, it helps, to live, helps us to live from a heart of rest in Jesus the other six days as well. And it causes us to long for the rest to come even more. And so, so think about those questions. Think about what day you can set aside. Think about what things you need to stop doing to subvert the story that those things are telling you. And think about what things that you want to replace that with instead that'll, that'll remind yourself who you are and what you're made for and where you're headed. Because that's the story that we're part of. We were made to live in God's rest. That's what Genesis 2, 1 to 3 is all about. We were exiled from God's rest in the fall though. But now in Jesus, we can enter God's rest again. And we look forward to the day when we will fully and finally live as God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing forever and ever in the new creation when Jesus returns. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this picture here in these three short verses in a lot of ways. It's just a short little section in Genesis 2. Um, in, in so many ways, we can overlook it. We can, we can focus on the end of chapter one and on the sixth day. Um, and, and just even with how the chapter break here is, we can miss this so easily. But oh, this is such a rich passage that sets up this incredible picture of the world that we were made for, the world that we live in now, and the, the hope that we have for the world that's to come, the new creation that's to come. So God, help us um, to, to reset the way that we think about rest in general, uh, Lord, I pray that this wouldn't just affect our lives. The things that we've looked at today wouldn't just affect our lives one day a week, but it would, it would affect our lives every day, that we would see uh, what we have in Jesus, that through him, the rest that we lost by being exiled from the garden, exiled from your rest in the beginning because of sin, now is being restored through Jesus, that in a real sense, spiritually now, physically to come, um, but, but in a real sense, spiritually now, we have that rest and can experience that rest and live in that rest in Jesus. And so, Lord, help us to, help us to see that. Help, us, help that to just change the way that we approach every day, the way that we work, the way that we live. Um, even in the middle of a fallen world where our work is still hard and where, where we still um, have to work hard to survive in this world now, Lord, pray that we would do that from a heart that's already at rest, knowing that, that, that our future is secure in Jesus and that we've already entered into that rest in him spiritually. But then, Lord, pray that we would fix our eyes even more on that day that's to come and that even this idea of taking one day a week to stop what we're doing to, to subvert the story that the world around us and that our, our normal daily habits are trying to weave into us, that, that we were made for this world and we have to work to sustain our lives or help us to fight against that. And maybe this idea of taking a day off a week and, and living this way would be helpful in that. Lord, if, if we do, then Lord, help us to, to make that day just be a day of joy, a day of, a day of living like the seventh day that we were made for in the beginning and that we will one day enjoy in the end is, is real for a day. And Lord, pray that that would be something that's not a burden for us, but it'd be a blessing and that it would feed into then six days, the other six days of resting in Jesus and fix our eyes even more on the kingdom that's to come. And so Lord, encourage us with these things. Help us as we think about how to apply them to our lives. Lord, pray that we wouldn't feel it as a burden, that we would see how it frees us up and that we would walk out of here feeling and, and, and enjoying and just in awe of the rest that we have in Jesus. Um, thank you, Father, that you rule and reign over all things and that Jesus now is seated, seated at your right hand, ruling and reigning, and one day we will be with you forever. Um, and Lord, pray that you would fix our eyes on that day. Uh, thank you for uh, this, this passage and how it uh, reorients our, our thoughts in all these ways. Pray that you would apply it to our lives in the week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.